talking to us. Um, yeah, Matt Wynn is the author of uh, the Cucumber of our Java book. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, 10 things not to do with BDD. Thank you much, uh, everyone. Round of applause for Matt. Thank you very much for coming out. Thanks, TJ. Am I on? I've got two, two clickers. Into, into Cucumber um, as a programmer who was frustrated by the communication gap between me and the other technical people and the people who we were supposed to be solving business problems for. Um, Felt like everybody wasted a lot of time, a lot of energy, building the wrong thing. Into, into Cucumber um, as a programmer who was frustrated by the communication Brian. gap between me and the other technical people and the people who were supposed to be solving business again? problems yeah. for. Um, felt like everybody wasted a lot of time, a lot of energy, a very slow building the wrong in, thing. Into into Cucumber um, as a programmer who was frustrated <laughs> by the communication if I say it again, between we me could just and the other technical people and the, the people who were supposed to be solving okay. business How problems you done for. That? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I could felt sing. like everybody wasted a lot of time, a lot of energy, <laughs> very slow building the wrong in, thing. Into The other way that we do that is we teach techniques to people. So I've just been teaching a two-day course with Ed uh, Snodgrass here um, in, the, in the room, kindly uh, lent to us by the lovely folks at Smart Bear, teaching these techniques. And the techniques that we're talking about are difficult. It's not easy to do this stuff. It's very powerful. It's very effective. Um, any organization, any person I know that's experienced it doesn't want to go back. But it's not easy to do, and it's kind of fragile, actually. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, marketing. So think about these efforts to bring in these techniques, like nurturing a plant, right? And do you know? Uh, have you, do you get that here in the states where you can buy a basil plant at the supermarket? Yeah. And it looks all nice in the supermarket, doesn't it? And then you bring it home, and after a week or two, it doesn't, doesn't look so good anymore. It's kind of wilted and floppy and a bit dead. And that's not the basil plant's fault, right? That's because you didn't look after the basil plant. And the thing with these practices is, if you want them to take root in your organization, you have to create the environment for them to, to thrive and, and, and nourish them. So I'm actually going to take a sort of sarcastic, because um, I'm British, I'm going to take a sarcastic angle on this for you for now and talk about all the ways you can kill your basil plant. So you can laugh if you want. That would be good. Um, here's a quick summary of all the ways that you can screw things up. 
So a good way to start is try and change everything all at once. I'm going to run through these in more detail in a minute. We can make it mandatory. Keep the pressure on the team. Don't budget for anything else that you might need to do, like DevOps to support teams. Just focus on the tools. Keep the silo strong. Keep everybody apart in their different disciplines. Have a messy backlog. Avoid anybody who's got experience, previous experience with it. And keep your feature files hidden. And oh, yeah, here's a good one. Try and do it on a legacy code base. That's a good idea as well. <laughs> so any one of these can probably screw it up for you. If you, if you get more than one, you're, you're, uh, you're really getting somewhere. So let's think about the first one. So many places. And, and I think especially like somebody senior has been to a conference talk or whatever, and, and they're like, yeah. I want to. I want BDD. I want BDD for all my people. I want everyone to start being, doing BDD. Yeah. And they're 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 all excited, and they want to just try and get everybody doing it straight away. Um, and that is a really great way to dilute any resources, energy that you have for making this change happen, so thinly that probably nothing will happen at all. Um, and you know, there's all that inertia that's there. There's a lot of resistance to change. So you know, the more you try and change at the same time, the more of that resistance you're going to hit. So trying to change everything all at once is a, is a really good way to fail. I think with any kind of a change, sort of going to boss level and telling people they've got to do it rather than presenting it to them as a solution to a problem that they experience, would also be a really good way to get, get that resistance up. So to make sure that people are afraid, um, annoyed, skeptical. So tell them they've got to do it. And another good thing you can do is if they're you know, already operating at full steam, trying their best to deliver features, deliver user stories as fast as they can, don't let up. Don't let up the pressure. If you want them to learn a new skill, or rather, if you don't want them to learn a new skill, make sure they haven't got any time to learn any new skills. Just keep on that pressure all the time. And it might be that these teams need new facilities in your organization. So teams that are trying to do test automation for the first time in an organization, for example, they're probably going to need to be able to get hold of a server where they can run their tests. Right? They probably need to be able to just click a button, run a script, get a fresh machine. Maybe they're going to script their installation of their application on that machine. And they'd like to be able to run that script regularly and test it. So why not put three layers of management approval in the way of anybody getting hold of a machine? That would be a good idea, wouldn't it? That'll slow that right down. Because um, those AMIs, those, uh, those VMs on your virtual infrastructure, they're, they're really expensive, aren't they, compared to the, the, amount, the wages you pay your developers while they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting for the three layers of management approval. So don't waste money paying for virtual machines that you don't need. Another mistake you can make is just to think about the tools. Everybody gets obsessed with the tools. Actually, as we've just been learning about in the training course, like we, sp we spent a two-day training course learning about BDD. The first day, nobody opened a laptop. It was all about the collaboration. It was all about the stuff that we can do together to figure out what the problem is that we're supposed to be solving. And if we forget about that side of BDD and all we do is the technical stuff, all we do is the fiddling around with the tools, we're going to miss the best bits. So avoid the best bits. 
focus on the tools. Get everybody excited about the technology. Don't let them talk to each other. You've got a QA department. You've got developers. You've got business analysts. Make sure they're all sitting on separate floors. Don't let them sit together. You've, you don't know what's going to happen if they start talking to each other. Separate countries, even better. Separate time zones, great. Planets. Yeah, different planets. Yeah, so that's good as well. Keep everybody separate. Um, and, you know, the, the team have, are going to have to be working on problems that are coming through from your agile process. So tr try not to be too good at that agile process. Try and make sure that the work that they are trying to bring in and, and figure out and, uh, and do um, is, is a mess, you know? Um, Good idea not to have product owners who've had any training. Try not to let product owners get any training at all. Um, keep them just part time, like you know, somebody from the business who just has to spend kind of like half an hour a week with with the team in a, a show and tell meeting or whatever it is. But the rest of the time they've got a day job. Um, don't make it a sort of a professional thing that anybody would aspire to be a, a product owner. So the so the backlog can be a real mess. Um, so the team are pulling these things off the backlog and they've got no idea what they are or, or who to speak to. That's another really good way to screw things up. And, you know, have you ever met anybody that's, that's done TDD or BDD? Have you ever met, has anyone ever met anyone? And, and they've got this kind of zeal, haven't they? You really don't need people like that around. There, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of courage and confidence that's needed to get through the, the sort of painful early days because it is going to feel painful initially while you're learning how to do it. You're making lots of mistakes. You're pushing your learning to happen earlier on in, in your development cycle, and that feels painful. And it's really easy to lose your nerve. And if you've got these zealous people around who've been through that painful period and they know how good it can be on the other side, they might just help you push through it. So you definitely don't, wanna, don't want any of them around. And if you are um, trying to write documentation, trying to write living documentation, trying to use these scenarios, you know, part of the... the the benefit of that can be to, to share them so that the business analysts and non-technical people can see those feature files, those scenarios as a kind of documentation, as a living documentation of your system. So try and make sure they can't get hold of them. Bury them away in source control. Don't use tools like uh, we've got a tool Cucumber Pro, we've got hip test. Um, these wonderful tools where you can share your feature files with your, with your stakeholders and, and get them out on the surface. Try and avoid anything like that. Keep them locked away in source control and then um, nobody really knows what's going on. And yeah, as I said earlier on, you know, learning on a legacy code base. I'll tell you a story. Um, I'm 43 now. When I turned 40, or before I turned 40, I decided I make a, made a secret pact with myself I was going to run a marathon. I decided I was going to run a marathon. And it was about three years before I'd never really done much running. Um, but I, I kind of became a runner, and I got fit enough to do a marathon. I signed up for this marathon in, in sort of June of that year. My birthday was coming in August. And um, I'd learned that I don't really like running on roads. I like running on mountains, on trails. So I signed up for a trail marathon, the Coniston man Marathon. Um, and it turns out that that marathon has, uh, now I'm going to be on camera, so I might be uh, exaggerating, but I think somewhere, somewhere around about 1,000 meters, maybe 1,200 meters of, of vertical ascent through, through, the, through the run. Um, and it's all, it's all trails. And some of it's actually quite technical trails. Um, and uh, I didn't really realize how hard it was going to be. And I remember in the car park before I set off 
uh, for this marathon, I was getting changed and I was talking to this guy and, and he said, uh, so you, have you done a marathon before? I said, no, it's my first one. And he just looked at me like, are you crazy? Because this is a really hard race, it's a really tough race. And actually I got cramped halfway through and it, um, I hobbled around the second half and it took me six hours to finish this race. But it was a really hard place to start, right? It was a really tough um, ask of myself for, for my first, first hard, difficult thing to do. And TDD, BDD, are diffi it's difficult, difficult to do. And if we ask developers to do it on a legacy code base, it's a really good way to put them off, to knock their confidence, to make them want to give up. So obviously I'm joking. These 10 things are a really bad idea. Because I think BDD is ace. I think it's brilliant. I think it uh, kind of changes people's lives, actually. Um, so I don't want you to do any of those things. And if you, and so instead of trying to change all the things all at once, I really, really encourage you, uh, like, what's your name, is it Al Alan? Yeah, was saying just before uh, when we're having pizza, this is exactly what they're doing. Like, start really small and focus. Put all of your energy into one team. Just forget about everybody else. Let them just carry on doing whatever it is that they are, they're already doing. Focus in on one team and then focus in on one user story that that team's doing this week. And let them carry on doing everything else the same way as they've always done. But just pick that one user story and let it take as long as it needs to take no deadlines, and do it right. Do it by the book. Do everything the way that you've learned about in the books. Do it as well as you can. And use it as a vehicle for learning. Learning about how to do this stuff. Learning about how to do this stuff here at your place. What's difficult, what's getting in the team's way. Listen to the team. Find out what's difficult. Take those problems away. See what you can get out of their way for next time. And instead of bossing people around and telling them what they need to do, telling them that they need to start doing this stuff. Tell them it matters. So what, one thing I do see, I, I sometimes see, see managers saying, you know, everyone needs to start doing test-driven development now. But more often what I see is they just don't say anything. They want people to do TDD. They want the benefits. And they... They, they don't say to not do it, but they don't carry on encouraging people and telling them that it's right and that it's, necess and it, and that it's important and that it matters and that it's okay and they've got time to learn. Because the thing I've seen, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but developers, we developers, seem to always assume that we haven't really got that much time and we ought to rush and we ought to cut a corner and just get on with it. Unless we're being encouraged and told that it's okay, we're gonna we're gonna assume that we haven't got time. So it's kind of giving giving support and encouragement is really important. And that's kind of inwards towards the team, but also buying support for the team from the outside. So taking that pressure off by selling the benefits to business to the business making sure the business realize why the team need to invest, why they need to slow down a little bit to speed up. Um, I like the analogy of like a, an athlete or a, um, a sports team. You think about like professional, I don't know, I say football, so soccer players in, in Britain, but baseball or American football or whatever. Like, how much of their week do they spend playing professional matches, competitive matches, and how much of their week do they spend practicing? And what do we ask software engineers to do all week? How much of the time do they get to practice and, and improve and, and, uh, and hone their skills? And if you want them to, to take a step up and learn new skills, you can't expect them to learn those new skills if they're just playing competitive matches all week. They will not get the space. They will not get the headspace. So you've got to buy a bit of a bit of space. You've got to help the business understand this is an investment. And 
you're going to need to think about your infrastructure. You're going to need to think, make sure that there are servers available for teams to, to get hold of. All of that kind of stuff. You're going to need to listen to that first pilot team, find out what's hard, find out what they needed. And instead of, instead of focusing on the tools, just start with the discovery stuff. Just start with the collaboration stuff. Start by talking to each other. Start with the, the workaround examples. When um, Seb wrote this great book, um, Discovery, about BDD, he's characterized the, the, the process as these three feedback loops. So first, we take an idea and we talk about it. There's a feedback loop there. And out of that process comes some examples that we can use to create or formulate documentation that describes what we want the system to do. And then we can go around another feedback loop while we review that and make sure that that clearly describes what we agree we want the system to do. And this might feel like overhead. And sometimes it is if you're doing it on trivial, obvious problems. But if the problem's got any kind of complexity to it, this is really useful investment, and it's cheap. It's so much cheaper to have a little chat for 20 minutes and sit down and write some text files than it is to go off and write the wrong code. That's really expensive and wasteful, right? So we had this couple of feedback loops in before we go off into our good old TDD loop and, and build, build software that matters. But start with this stuff, because this is really cheap. You can, I don't have the slide here, but um, if you Google for example mapping, it's a really simple technique you can do with a pack of index cards and a Sharpie, and everybody can learn it in, in an hour. And you can very quickly start breaking down your stories and seeing where there's uncertainty in them and what you need to do. Right. And then instead of silos, preach this. Quality is everybody's responsibility. You can't leave somebody else to, to test your code for you. Um, who is it? Uh, oh, my mind has gone blank. My brain is dry. One of you, you three will tell me. The, let's make toast. I'll burn it. You scrape it. Who's that? Simon. It's the guy. No, no, no. It's the, it's the management consultant who came back and told us all about Toyota in the 50s. Anyway. De Deming, yes. It's Deming. You, uh, let's make toast. I'll burn it. You scrape it. So it's an atrocious way to do quality. But that's the way that people are used to building software. Right? I'll write the bugs, you find the bugs. So don't do that. Don't work in silos. Work together to make nice toast, nice tasty toast that's not burnt. Much more fun. And although silos are bad and K, do think about those communities of practice, because you're going to have lonely people being QAs off on all these different teams, being developers on all these different teams, learning things in, in separate little pockets. Keep the communities of practice alive so people get to share their, their ideas. And make sure that you, you've got the hang of the basics. Make sure that you've got the hang of having a, a decent, refined, ordered backlog before you start trying to do this kind of stuff. Make sure everybody knows what a user story is, and that a user story is not a three-month small project. Because trust me, you, know, you try and do a discovery workshop on a three-month small project, that's not going to take 25 minutes. And uh, yeah, pull in some people with experience. I think it's really important, actually, to, to have at least one person in the place who has been over to the other side of the mountain and knows how good it can be. I think it's really important. Because it is hard. And 
people will lose energy, will lose spirit, and to have one person there who's done it and believes in it, it will really help you to keep going. And frankly, they, you know, they know where a lot of the, the, the dragons are and can help you steer around them. Keep your feature files on the surface, make sure everybody can see them. They're a really important part of this. Make sure you're being inclusive. And yeah, if you can, try and do it on a nice greenfield project first. Make it easy on yourselves. T Legacy code is a hard, hard place to, to do test-driven development. Um, it's kind of fun. I quite like trying to do it. But it's not an easy place to learn. There you go. That's my, um, that's my advice. How am I doing for time? We started a little bit late, didn't we? Was that half an hour? Yeah. And I can't hear myself on a 10 second loop anymore, so that's good. <laughs> that was really, really weird. <laughs> I just realized how boring I sound as well. <laughs> anyway, so there you go. That was my talk. Have you got any questions? Should we have a chat? There's a, there's a microphone around somewhere, I think. Where is it? Microphone? Is it? Or talk? Oh, I'm not supposed to go past there, so someone else needs to hand this around. Is it, I've got the lapel. If I go over there, it's going to squeak. Good memory. Yes. Thank you. So some of the points you mentioned were about uh, having a nice clean backlog, which is always a good thing, but I'm wondering how that helps with BDD. Well, so the way I see, maybe I'll take it back to the diagram. This is, this is something that we want to do not too far ahead of, of this, where we're going to build the code. And the grist into the mill here is, I'm assuming, a, a reasonably sized, reasonably refined user story. Because if this thing here is just somebody's fuzzy idea, you're going to spend an awful lot of time doing this and popping out more user stories back onto the back. And you can do that, but frankly, there are better techniques for that. You've got story mapping. You've got impact mapping. There are other techniques for doing that stuff. This is, this is more the boundary of what I see as being BDD is something that's much more just around the development team to shield them, kind of shielding the machinery from getting these lumps of crap coming in that are poorly understood and clog it up, making sure that they're nice small pieces so it flows well. So it's quite late in the, in the cycle, if you like. What other questions do you have? I'm really interested by the fact that you threw out the concepts of story mapping and impact mapping because to, from what I know about those techniques, those sound like a great way to make sure that what you intend to do is visible as you're talking about. And the getting down into the depths of individual stories goes just one step farther into that. But uh, thanks for throwing those into the to this Yeah, discussion. I mean, that's the wider context around this. And this is like, let's assume that we've got one story now, what are all of the examples that are going to need to be satisfied by the system in order for that story to be done? And we still need some rigor in that because actually what we find is that we're discovering too late, right? So, you know, how, how many times when we haven't done enough of this do we end up in here somewhere and the developer's writing the if statement and they write else and they go, oh, yeah, what should it do? <laughs> product owner, oh, product owner's not here. They're in another time zone. So we're just trying to push that, that discovery to happen just in time, not too late. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah, I had one. I just wanted to give other people an opportunity. To, I didn't want to ask twice, twice the questions of anybody else. Uh, so assuming that you're, you're doing it right and you've already like gone past the learning curve and you've got the clean backlog and everybody's talking to each other, what is the relative level of effort difference between this and, let's say, you know, straight TDD? Well, if any. Yeah, uh, 
how do you know what, how do you know what's your first test to write? What are you going to do? You're probably going to have a conversation with someone, or you're going to have had a conversation with someone. Like so, um, I think it's Ron Jeffries talks about card conversation confirmation, and this this is just a structured way of doing that conversation confirmation bit. Or this is conversation, this is confirmation, and um, some. Some TDD practitioners have liked to write uh, some kind of business readable acceptance test, whether it was with fitness or um, s some of those other tools. And this is the, s the same kind of an idea, is that you, you're going to, before you sit down and go off into your TDD loop, you're going to make sure you've got the acceptance tests written out and, and confirmed first before you go off and, and do that, that second bit. So it's really very similar to... So Steve Freeman, for example, who uh, wrote the wonderful book, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests, um, thinks that BDD is snake oil because it just describes the way he does test room development. And, and like, I've, got n I've got no argument with that at all. I mean, Steve's, a, Steve's a hero of mine. Um, and the thing is, that's fine for Steve, but actually most pr places that we see that are practicing TDD, they are rushing into writing the test without having really figured out what was the first test to write. And maybe they've missed a whole bunch of examples that they're going to discover as they're writing the code, rather than they could have thought about a little bit ahead of time and got some confirmation on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. If so, if I can, you, you're already doing the discover work under any circumstances if you're doing it right. You need, yeah, you need to speak to the product owners and know what you're supposed yeah. to be developing, uh, and and presumably you're already writing tests. So the only real added piece is the orchestration of those tests using the, the plain language English. Right. To yeah, and and up. and the and I guess the uh, the, the the deliberate explicit um, remembering to to do this bit before we dive in to do that bit. Just acknowledging that that's a that's a part of it that we need to do, and sort of thinking about some ways to to do that well. Thank you. There's nothing new under the sun. I'll hold this up you in case anybody brilliant. else wants you to ask anything. It's just the two of us are yeah. bouncing back and forth. I like the fact that you're talking about the formulate step as a way of putting together some kind of a documenting. Because I work with the FDA regulated industry, you know, and all the medical device and clinical trial data yeah. management stuff. They're required to document their stuff. And I keep trying to tell people, you can do that as a natural outcome of the work that you're doing. Yeah. And if you associate conditions of satisfaction, i.e. tests that you intend to run, yeah. as, as part of developing individual stories, you've got traceability, yeah. which is one of the requirements that so many people struggle over. So yeah. thank you for bringing that in, because that's an important element we can handle this. It doesn't have to be a big and, and this is thing. this is one of these things that ends up being a, a, a lovely benefit and and it's it's a side effect, right? It's just like a, a a thing that happens along the way if you're doing this as a practice anyway. Oh whoops, look we've got this documentation and it's always up to date because we just ran some tests on it. It's really good. Yeah. I do have one other a very minor thing, just kind of because I I get a little confused by this. So often I hear people <clears throat> make an assumption when you say TDD, oh yeah, yeah, our unit tests, we're gonna automate our unit tests. I'm going, yeah. so is there an agreed distinction between test-driven development and behavior-driven development? <laughs> <laughs> well, am I, am I like I to say, so I'm gonna, we're coming back to the Steve Freeman thing, right? Um, I, I like to say that all BDD does is it formalizes the good habits of the best TDD practitioners. So we're just reminding people how to do TDD well. If you go back and read Kent Beck's book, he's talking about writing customer acceptance tests as well as unit tests. It's just that TDD as popularly practiced today tends to uh, omit the acceptance testing part, doesn't it? We don't often see people thinking about doing that. They see it, it's become seen as an engineer's practice, as a solution domain practice. And what we're trying to do here is 
pull people back into the problem domain and hold them in the problem domain for as long as possible. So, yeah. Any other papers? Come on. I'll just make Somebody a, who's never asked a I'll, question at a meeting before just make a little a question. comment. Oh, on, Nancy. So Ron Jeffries said, card, conversation, confirmation. And you're saying card, conversation, confirmation, automation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. That's my two cents. Somebody who's never asked a question at a meetup before, ask us a question. Come on. We're supposed to do that for the first one, aren't we, really? Yay. I just got here, so I don't know if you already answered this question, but I was wondering what layer of the application do you automate? when you talk about automating the BDD, is it yeah. the unit level, the API level, or the UI level? So whatever level is gonna help you sleep at night best. Okay. Um, the lowest level possible that's gonna help you sleep at night best. The, the lower level you can go in the code, the faster the test's gonna be, the better an indicator of what's wrong it's gonna be when it fails, um, the more reliable it's gonna be. You know, if you're trying to automate all the layers, um, there's, there's more chances of it going wrong. Um, but if it's all passing, you've got more comfort. Uh, and the, the, the very best practice I see, uh, whether it's TDD or BDD, is if your acceptance tests are actually able to hit the system at, at multiple layers, so you can do different runs of them. So you can run exactly the same acceptance test through your user, user interface or against your domain model. So you can, day to day, you run them against your domain model. While you're sleeping at night, you run them against your UI. Okay. That's the absolute ideal, yeah. Okay, thank you. Ed's got one. One more. One more. So when you talk about using the same feature files and running it at different levels, is there a blog post or something that talks more about how to actually technically implement that? Uh, I don't know about a blog post. Um, Aslack has, so this Cucumber School videos do it, don't they? Yes. Um, the, the last episode of the Cucumber School videos, but you have to pay for those. But Aslack, my uh, co-founder of Cucumber and, and uh, actually the creator of the, of the, the Cucumber framework, um, is talking a lot these days about this. He has a conference talk you can Google for, which is called Subsecond TDD sub-second TDD, so he's all about fast feedback from your tests, and um, he talks about this a lot, about sort of modular architecture, so you can plug your tests in at multiple levels. Sorry, I just wanted to mention, you also have your own talk on skills share, or skills, skills, matter. skills matter. Yeah. It's called uh, TDD, or BDD the way it's meant to be. Oh yeah, I remember that where one. Where you drive oh. the domain There we go. And, oh, I, I, I show, I'm constantly posting it to my coworkers every six months or so. <laughs> Remember Eventually, this is possible? it's going to drip through. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's gone you know, about three times. Three so years. when you can get that working, it is awesome, definitely. Yeah, it's really, really good. But it does, t again, it takes, it takes, some, it takes some work. There's, oh, there's another good conference talk, actually. Uh, Nat Price, who co-authored the Goose book with Steve Freeman, um, he spoke at our conference, QCUP uh, 2017, and his talk was called uh, Functional Tests That Run in Milliseconds, something like that. Functional Tests running, That Run in Milliseconds. And it was exactly about the same thing again, about being able to plug your acceptance testing, low down the stack and, and run them super quick. Yeah, it's the way forward, folks. Is that it? I think we're done. So then. <laughs> Have you got a mic on? You got one on so I can turn mine off.
this one? This one seems to work. Um, is the mic working fine? Great. So, hello. Hi. Uh, so, in this talk, what I'm going to yeah, explain is how we use BDD and uh, product analytics, HATIP test uh, to improve so the quality of our product. And this talk is mainly going to be so what is our own technique to test. Uh, in a DevOps context. So, so I'm Vincent, I'm one of the developers at IpTest. And just a quick word about IpTest. So it's a continuous testing platform, which is now part of SmartBear. And the reason why I'm talking about that is that I'm going to show some examples, some of our feature files, some living documentation. And we, do, we use IpTest to test IpTest. So some example may be a bit meta. You will see some living documentation about creating living documentation or feature files about writing feature files. So don't worry, we won't go deep in that, but you'll see it can be a bit meta in the example, but should be fine. So uh, during this talk, first I'm going to explain a bit what will be the difference when it comes to testing in a DevOps context. And what we've learned, so in our journey from one release every two weeks to one release or at least multiple releases a day. Because of course that changed a bit. And what we've learned there, uh, so from our expertise and our habits of testing, uh, our testing process is now in four steps. So testing the ID, testing the code, testing what has been delivered in production, and iterating for the next sprint or the next session. And I guess I'm gonna conclude after that. So, testing in DevOps. Here, when I mean DevOps, is more in a context where you've got multiple deployments a day, or at least really quick deployments. I'm not going to talk about the great relation we have between the developers, the ops, and so on more on what DevOps bring and definitely one of the greatest, or at least I think so, advantage when it comes to DevOps is yeah, this possibility to say I commit and half an hour later what I did is in production. And when it comes to testing in DevOps, first question, what's the biggest opportunity we get there? And basically that's the speed. Not the speed of deployment, not the speed of coding, not the speed of the test running, it's really the speed of the feedback loop. So like I said before, I'm committing something, I push that to Git, one hour later, half an hour later, the customers will be able to use this. And this gives us yeah, a feedback loop which is really, really, really fast, and something which is really great. One example I've seen, it's uh, Dan North who was talking about that, uh, about the feedback loop, he was talking about uh, the ESP system uh, you've got on most of the cars, no, I guess. Uh, so electronic stability program, something like that. Anyway, the idea is that it's going to measure uh, the speed of the different wheels and so on, like 10, 15, 100 times per second to be sure that your car is staying on track and not yeah, ending in the ditch. Here, it's going to be the same idea really having this classical loop, so from ID to developing to getting that in the end of the end users and getting some data from that, having this loop that won't take two months. Right? Just to get an ID from you, how many of you are deploying at least once every two weeks? At least. I, I know how much you, you go for. And if you keep your hands up, uh, once every week, at least. Multiple times a week. Multiple times a day. Oh, I'm not surprised, but <laughs> yeah. Basically, when you do that, you kind of have an ESP for your production. Because in the meantime, between your commit and your first feedback, yeah, it's really, really fast. And that's what's really helpful, at least what we found the most helpful when migrating, or at least moving from one releases every two 
two weeks to multiple ones a day. To give an idea of how we work at Iptest, so we start defining a backlog in Trello, which is, by the way, a public Trello board accessible to yeah, anyone. This is the first way we get a quick feedback, a quick feedback because sometimes we post ID there and we let the users, anyone, upvote the different incoming features and already there we got some feedback like, mm, this feature might be trendy. Lots of people are voting because they want that integrated in the product. And that gives us a really great idea and basically for nothing, just creating a Trello card and getting some feedback. She's the first really quick feedback loop. At the beginning of every sprint, basically we say, okay, we need to do something. And we start to do some planification. So the user story will be refined with example, using example mapping and some good practices. Uh, Matt uh, showed just before. We'll then implement uh, the story, implement test cases. As I said, commit, push that to Git or CI CD pipeline, it's shippable, it's going to yeah, run all the tests, send that to production. Generally, we do some you know, exploratory testing to ensure that yeah, we didn't really screw things up because yeah, it's always nice to have automated testing, but still just checking by the eye if it looks great can be a good idea. And monitoring that and yeah, basically getting back again and again. So of course we don't do this loop 10 times a day because we are just developers and we can't do that 10 new features a day, but at least let's say the, the back of the, the bottom of the, the loop, we do that yeah, multiple times a day. So what we've learned from that, uh, we've got a four step principle when we want to test a feature, we need to pull feature. So We've got four questions. What do we want to deliver? What is the value for our users and for us as a company? When we start working on that, well, is the code we made really aligned with what we decided at the beginning? Then it goes on production. Is this feature really useful for our customers, for our users? It's always good. And last, definitely not least, do they have a good user experience? And what's the feature usage in time? So let's go in all those different steps. And to start, we'll go by defining and testing the ID. First thing we do before anything, before working on a feature is, okay, challenge the business assumption. What do we want to deliver? Why is this feature useful for a test? Is it going to really help the user? So yeah, they may sign up more on the platform. Is it going to help them stay on the platform because they like it? Sometimes there is absolutely no benefit, at least for the company. Won't make the people stay more or sign up more. But it's going to make their life easier. So sometimes. There is no business benefit, but we'll still do that because well, first we like our users and yeah, we'll make them feel better on the application. So to define what is the value we want to deliver, we first use personas and job to be done to create yeah, some intimacy between the developers and uh, the real end users. So at Iptest, we have multiple personas like a manual tester, an automation engineer or developer, a QA lead, a product owner, a business analyst. We even have the people from the marketing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that helps a lot, especially as a developer, because when I'm starting to work on a feature, yeah, I can get myself in the shoes of this user. It's pretty easy when it's a developer, surprisingly, but yeah. It's really good because you're like, okay, what would a manual tester do exactly? You put yourself in the mindset of this person and it helps you yeah, create a feature that is more fitted for that person. Then business assumption as we've seen, and we use, you'll be surprised, behavior driven development so to capture the behavior. 
So after Matt's talk, I'm going to go really quickly over BDD because, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did that better than me. Uh, so just, yeah, quick explanation about, yeah, or at least quick overview. So defining collaboratively, collaboratively, so developers, product owner, et cetera, what is the feature we want to work on, translating that into automated tests, and at the end, having a living documentation, so we'll have more example later on, for our uh, new feature. So here's just an example of yeah, some BDD uh, sample we have in IPTES. Some good practices we've set up at IPTES, and yeah, when, let's say, more technical than on the, the principle of BDD, uh, so when it comes to use or to write our own features, example, and so on, what we decided to do first is use uh, the Gherkin syntax and really the yeah, BDD yeah, Gherkin scenarios will only use them, let's say, on purpose. We want only to use those examples when it comes to discussion with uh, business or product owner and so on. The reason for that, a few years ago, one of our developers that we'll call Vincent, so for anonymity purpose, he saw there was lots and lots of uh, non-regression tests, really, integration tests, like mm, I click there, I go back there, I do this, I do that, and there is no bug. It was like, mm, I can translate that into Gherkin. I did, he did, he did, I did, I, not me. So he did that. And the scenarios were really Gherkin scenarios. Well, at least it passed with Cucumber. But it was not BDD, it was just integration test with some given when then, when then, when then, when then, because he was really awful at that. Uh, and yeah, when the people from the product team, business, were looking at the scenario, they were like, what kind of feature is that supposed to, to describe? Mm, I don't know, I'm doing BDD. No, I wasn't. I was writing Gherkin, which was fine, but that was not BDD. So what we decided to do is say, okay, when we are writing scenario with the Gherkin syntax, we do that so we can communicate between all persons in the company about what a feature does. If we want to write uh, really integration test, non-regression test, anything that yeah, checks it works fine but has no purpose as describing what the product does, how it works, yeah, we write that in our spec, it works pretty fine and that's it. So, we keep given when then and working for a discussion base, even though it's translated as automated test later on. Another thing from this wonderful failure from this developer, uh, we force, so I know it's bad to force the developers, but yeah, at least we try our best to use declarative style. Same thing, those examples were like, oh, I'm clicking this button. It doesn't describe, I wasn't describing what we were doing, we were describing how we were doing that. And that was not, once again, the goal. So we do our best and once again, it's sometimes hard to say, to at least not to say, I'm clicking on this button. No, I'm creating a new scenario. I told you it was going to be meta. So we've got a scenario saying when I create a scenario, not when I click on the new scenario button, because we want to focus on what is done and not how it's done. That's, and it's hard, but we do our best and we're getting better and better at doing that. Third thing really important, coming from another failure at BDD, we do our best to reuse always, but most as, po most as possible, consistent business terminology, using the same steps from scenario to scenario, because it speeds up the automation, because it is the maintenance of the different scenarios. And so this second fit, uh, failure at BDD, so this time it was not this Vincent developer at IPTES, it was another guy from the product team that I won't name. Uh, we decided to yeah, write a scenario, same thing. He did the same error than this Vincent developer did, being forgetting what is really important in BDD, so the discussion. And he started writing some feature on his side saying, hey, look, that's better. 
That was better. That was way easier to understand. That was a pain to automate, real pain. So that was also a bad idea. Because, yeah, using lots of different sentences to say the same thing. So maintenance, oh, doesn't it already exist, this step, and so on, this kind of thing. So now we do our best to reuse as much as possible. Consistent business terminology, it helps in maintenance, in automation, and to understand. Because when you are a newcomer in the company, if all the examples are using the same terminology, it's way easier to understand what the product does. Because classical example, but I log in, I sign in. Is there a difference between login and sign in, in fact? You know, this kind of stupid thing. So we do our best to reuse again and again the correct stuff. And last, but definitely not least, we spend a lot of time in reviewing and refactoring. To give some context, at IPTest currently we have two feature team plus one maintenance team. People are going from team to team, but that's not a problem. When we start working on a new feature, so there is the free Amigo session between some developers of the feature team that's going to work on this new feature with the product owner, with anyone who wants to work on that. So they do the example mapping, they write the different scenario, the different example. And what we do is say, okay, let's take one guy from this other team, so the second feature team. Let him have a look to those examples. Does he understand what the feature is going to do? Because if only the product owner and the guys who are working on that understand what it does, but other developers that may work on the feature in six months, for example, because there is a bug, because lots of reason to work again on it. If those other guys who were not there during the meeting don't understand the example, that's not a good thing. So external reviews can be really a great thing to ensure that, once again, everyone has the same vision on what the feature should be. So we've done our first part, testing the ID, having everyone aligned on what this new feature should do, what should it provide for the users, for the company, what will be the, the scope of the feature, and so on. One thing I forgot with the review, by the way, when it's a feature that comes from an ID that comes from our customers, and we don't really know that much about this feature itself, what's going to be the need. We also write sometimes the scenarios and say, hey, you told us you wanted that. These are some Gherkin examples. What do you think? Would that fit your need? Is that exactly what you want? An example we like to give uh, came for a few months ago, years. We were asked for the on-premises version, support for the LDAP authentication. We don't use LDAP. We don't have a clue how LDAP works. Because, yeah, don't use it. So, so oh, let's write some example. Let's send that to the people who asked for it. Is that exactly what you want? No. Ooh, good, we didn't develop it. Because you get this feedback loop once again. As soon as you've got a feedback saying, mm -mm, you're doing it wrong, the better it's going to be. So we've got now a clean ID, clear ID of what's the feature going to be. And it's time for the dev team to kick in. So normally that's where I arrive, me or someone else. So once again, what we want is to shorten the feedback loop. So we will not say we develop the complete feature, everything, and we send that to production. There is 15 examples to implement and to do. Maybe three examples will be fine. Just a teaser for our user. Just, OK, we'll do those three simple, free examples. That's not the full feature. That's just the core with, of it. But if we can create that, send that to production, and already get a feedback from our users, that's going to be great. Once again, we want to shorten the feedback loop. So we won't develop everything. We'll develop a first increment. We'll develop that. We commit. Of course, we automate the test. We commit. We send that to CI, CD, pipeline, and so on. And as I mentioned before in the loop, we are using CI, CD. So that means that 100% of our checks are automated. That doesn't mean we don't do any exploratory testing or manual checking. It 
would be pretty crazy to just trust the automated uh, test. But what that means is that there is no manual uh, validation or whatever to say that this commit goes to production. That's just automated. And if one human says, mm, that, shouldn't have, that shouldn't have got there, we can still roll it back. That's not a real issue. What's important to know is that full automation, that's expensive. That's done by developers or automation engineers. They'll spend time writing the test cases or automating them. They'll spend time maintaining them in the future. So that's not a way to cut costs. That's a way to cut uh, the speed of feedback. Simply that. It's expensive, but it's definitely worth it. To give an example, once again, a tip test, one of the features I worked on, a simple drag and drop of the different folders and different scenarios, etc. Pretty simple, one day to develop, two days to automate the test cases. Mainly because of issues with water and drag and drop, but still, two days, like, yeah, because it didn't want to work properly. But it was worth it. We know that this feature works every time this is uh, a commit is done. So expensive, but worth it. So to give an idea of how our uh, pyramid of tests look like, a tip test, we've got around 11,000 uh, automated tests right now. And to be frank, last time I checked, it was 11,900. So we are closer to the, 11, uh, to the 12 case. What's important there is to know that the BDD tests, so what we mean here by the BDD tests are really uh, the one uh, written in Gherkin and really meant to discuss between developers, products, etc. It's not that much. And all the rest come from TDD. There might be two, five percent, maybe less, uh, for non-regression specific stuff that didn't come from TDD, but yeah, most of them, almost all of them come from TDD and not, let's say, from BDD, or at least it's the ones that are not written with Gherkin. What we've seen often with, uh, so first a tip test and also with our users, lots of them think that, okay, BDD, we are going to cover all this part of the pyramid. Would be great, I'd love that. But that's exactly the failure this Vincent developer did a few years ago, trying to have everything uh, written in Gherkin. Even though it was not, once again, BDD. It was Gherkin, which is great, but it's not BDD. It's not a way to communicate. And yeah, what we see generally is like yeah, one third of really the UI part, at least once again for uh, the way we work here. And when it comes to the way we, we automate them, although I think I'm going to change after what uh, Matt said just earlier. One problem we had uh, a few years ago, so we were automating everything with uh, selenium, with water for Ruby, but anyway. And the more tests we had, the longer it took to pass, obviously. And also the more brittle they were, at least unstable. Lots of failure for stupid thing, one Ajax call not coming back early enough and so on. If you do Selenium, I guess you've already had this kind of thing. And everything was uh, so automated using Selenium. So we decided to change that a bit. All the given part now is just done at the backend level. Because, yeah, creating a new account, creating a new project, having some example set up with, once again, different feature file in example, blah, blah, blah. It's just the context in which the scenario takes place. You don't want to check this works. We've got other examples, like I'm creating a scenario or I'm doing that. So the given part now is always done at the backend level. It's way faster, it's way more variable. The when part, we always automate that with water or selenium. Because what we want to check is yeah, what the user is going to do. So this, always we are using selenium. For the then part, that will depend. So simple example, but I want to check that a new project has been created uh, in the, the database. I'm going to check that in the database. Once again, faster and so on. 
I want to check a user has got a new uh, notification. I'm going to check with water. So simple as that. So now we've got a first increment of the, the new feature that has been automated and tested. So the CI CD, does it work? He says, hey, hey, everything is working fine. Let's go to production. And now we'll have to test a few things there. So first thing to note, it's not because it's on production that it's visible for everyone, of course. That would be crazy, that would be fun, but that would be mainly crazy. So of course we get feature flag and stuff like that to avoid uh, normal users to see the feature. So we may do some beta, we may do some uh, rollout, general rollout. It will depend on the stage where we are. What's really important to note is what we focus the most on now is not the correctness of what we do. We are a SaaS product, and what's really important for us is the availability. We prefer to have one bug that may impact, let's say, half of the people. I mean, not like a bug that destroys all the data, of course, but, you know, simple bug, I want to drag and drop a folder, it doesn't work. Okay, that's bad. But in one hour, we can fix that. On the contrary, when the servers are down for one hour, it's all our users that can't work because that's a, a tool for work. I mean, they are not using IPTest just for the fun of writing scenarios and doing living documentation. It's the tool for work, so we need to be sure that those people, free users or customers, same problem. We want to be sure that what the, the, the use for work is available. So for us, the availability is becoming more important than the correctness. Doesn't mean we don't care about the bugs, of course, don't get me wrong, but we'll spend a lot and a lot of time to ensure that the production is up and running in the correct, uh, at least in a correct way. So to do so, we do lots of uh, monitoring, of course, using si uh, s <coughs> services like AppSignal, uh, alert sites, uh, Logmatic, Datadog, Scalingo is our provider, which gives us lots of data. And this is the kind of thing you can see in uh, all the offices of IPTES, right, the free offices of IPTES. So we can see directly, and at this moment, it's all green, so hooray. And sometimes it's partly red, and it's less hooray. So in that moment, we say, OK, we stop what we do, and we'll fix that production right now, because we screwed things up. So all the green part are uh, some really uh, application performance management. We also complete that with some, uh, let's say, marketing uh, data to see, okay, how many users are currently on the production that can also help wonder, understand why it's uh, going slow and so on. The other thing we monitor is the usage of our new feature because, as I said in the beginning, we want to know uh, at least we set some business metric about this new feature. We want to set some uh, threshold to know, okay, do we consider this is a good feature because that much number of people are using it? And to do so, we need to monitor, uh, <coughs> we need to monitor the production and see how much the people are using the feature. Because otherwise, we don't know if this is something useful or absolutely not. So we do this monitoring, and this is done at the living documentation uh, level. So here we can see uh, yeah, an example of living documentation. So describing what the new feature does, knowing that this living documentation is only composed of the example that, has been, that have been executed on the CI CD. So once again, really living documentation, and what we see there is only what is on production. And we complete that with some a uh, chart showing, okay, how much the people are using that. And here, for example, you can see the graph in a living documentation of how much people create living documentation. I told you sometime it's going to be meta, but that's one of the examples. So with the living documentation, we got a single place to collaborate. So we can see what the feature does and what it does, at least what it really does. What is the part that we've implemented, automated, and pushed to production? It may be a third of 
the, the feature. It can be the full feature, of course. We can also see its history, because it's pretty interesting to look at the feature and say, when did we do that? OK, ah, we started working on that six months ago. But we haven't done anything for four months, and we started working on it again, and so on. Really interesting, you know, how much it's been working. You see, of course, the test results. That's pretty useful. And you see the usage of it and the impact this feature has on the users. So that's how we test on pro in production. Monitoring the server system, really the application. Does it feel good? I'm not sure we can say that for a, for a production site, but you get the idea. And we also monitor the usage of the different feature. And at the end of the different sprints, it's time once again to iterate and know what we are going to do with the data we've gathered. So basically, we've got three metrics available. The usage of the feature, how much people are playing with it or using it at least. The completion of the example. How many of the example we wrote during the free Amigo session and the example mappings, how much of those examples are really implemented and automated? And the last one is the performances, or at least what's the impact of this feature on the servers. Technically, we can only impact on the two second one, the, the two last ones. The usage. We can do some advertising. We can make the, the UI a bit more fancier. But if it doesn't have any benefit for the user, he won't use the feature just to make us happy, hardly. So only the two last ones is, uh, we can impact on as developers or as anyone in the company. So we got three choices. What do we do with this feature? We can improve it. People are using it, so it's a good thing. We keep that. But either we have not yet completed the feature, so we may have implemented only a third of the different example, or we got issues uh, with the performances. So people love it, but the servers are crying when people love this feature. So in any case, next iteration, we continue working on that and make that better either on the behavior part or on the performance part. Second case, and not my favorite one, we abandon the feature. There is no traction. People, they use that once, twice, and that's all. In that case, once again, we can say, oh, we'll try to do some advertisement. We'll use some pendo to, to add some uh, data uh, or some pop-ups saying, hey, You've seen that, hey, you've seen that, but yeah, they've seen it, they don't use it. It's sad, but we remove the feature. We don't want. <laughs> I'm feeling so warm now. <laughs> so yeah, we don't want to spend time maintaining code that is useless. It's a waste of time, and spend enough time doing that as a developer. Like, ooh, new migration for Rails. I don't know which version we are now. Oh, <laughs> this thing no one used, we need to upgrade it to ensure it works with the new, uh, the new Rails, but no one uses it. So yeah, OK. Code, trash. The test, go to the trash too, because yeah, they won't run anymore without the code. And that's good. That's hard. When you worked on that, you were like, ooh, that's a good idea. I'm really happy to do this feature. No, no one cares. So it's sad. You can still find the code in some old branch anyway. But you have to trash this. Last case, better one. We validate the feature. We get some usage. People are really using it. Or at least it match what we decided would be the, the business metrics. We've implemented all the examples, and it doesn't break the servers, which is really good. So basically, it's validated. We can work on a new feature. But one thing to note is we are talking about continuous testing, continuous process. And this feature that has been validated today, maybe no one will use it anymore in two years. And in that case, can I get back? 
we need to abandon a feature that was like the star feature two years ago, but no one cares about it anymore. It's sad, but once again, no usage, no need, trash. But at least it's w less work for the developer, so that's always a good thing too. So to conclude, what are the, the benefits we found in uh, this approach and yeah, the way we work with that? So interesting to test the value first. We don't want to spend time, spend lots of time from the, <coughs> from the development team in developing something that has no need for the end users. So as we've got this short feedback loop, we can easily stop pretty early on. Simply because, okay, we may have done just a third of the feature, but the feedback are like, no, that's not what we want. That's not what we need. That has no value for the end user. So we stop doing that. Same principle, the investment in quality is really incremental. We won't start automating 1,000 different uh, test cases or BDD example. And yeah, in the end seeing that, mm, no, uh, that's useless. So we'll just, yeah, automate what we need, spend time in quality on small increments, but having directly feedback from our users, from the servers too, saying, mm, that's a good one. Let's keep working on it. It's incremental. We don't spend hours and hours for something that will be dropped in two weeks. And last but definitely not least, we got a pretty cool safety net. No, I tip that. So if we, do that, if we get ideas, we can challenge them. And the ideas don't always come from uh, the product management team or I won't say the people above because we are still pretty close, pretty small company, but We've had really great feature coming from the developers, coming from our users, saying, hey, you should do that. Yeah, let's try. We can challenge the ideas, make them try them on production pretty quickly, a feedback, and see, indeed, that was a good idea. Why didn't we have this one ourselves? But we got this idea, we try it, we get great feedback, let's continue working on it. And everyone can contribute as a developer, one of my games is when I'm on uh, conferences like this or on trips, the idea is, okay, let's do a, how do we, how to call that? Conference feature, like trying something, writing some small example, validating that with a product owner, something that wasn't planned, in fact, in the sprint. But that's fun. We can try some things, validate with uh, real users you s we see on conferences and so on. And that's great because we can experiment directly, show that, what do you think? Oh, looks great. And this thing is really, really cool. It's really something I like because I'm not scared to code. I'm not scared to try stuff, to get, yeah, real feedback. And sometimes my, my ideas suck. That happens. Sometimes they're good. So it's a bit of both. And to end up, because I'm starting to talk way too much, the definitive biggest risk when it comes to development or product or whatever is to make something that nobody wants. So don't spend time developing features that will end up in the bin because it was not such a good idea in the final. So if you have any question, I think it's time to fire them up. Yeah, 40 minutes. I guess there is a Okay, I had a somewhere. question. Um, Where are you? Yeah. Here. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned in the part of the cycle you had exploratory testing. I, I thought that was like very unique uh, that you actually include that as part of the de DevOps. How much do you budget for uh, exploratory testing? And how is it done in your company? So the idea is um, we've got a not real Kanban. I'm fighting to say that it's not a Kanban, but so what we plan to do during the iteration, it's on this whiteboard with lots of uh, Bristol cards. And so it goes from to do whip, to be validated, validated, done, done. So done, done is when it's on production and open to the users. And the exploratory testing will be done 
uh, when validating those different features. So when it's still hidden, hidden from the, the user, sometimes it's already available. But yeah, it's at this moment we do that. So the exploratory testing is the validation of the different features. Hope that answers your question. We don't do, well, we sometimes do, but it's not really planned like, okay, let's play a bit with the tool, especially when we've got feedback from our customers saying, or users saying, this is a bit buggy because that happens. And in that case, uh, we'll do some, okay, let's try lots of things and things and things. Yeah, do you use your tool to actually like do uh, uh, mind mapping on like as you're exploring the, uh, as you're doing the exploratory testing? Like what, sorry? Mind mapping? Or uh, anything, no, things not like that, that much. Okay. Sadly. Would be interesting. So when you talked about rolling back after something uh, maybe doesn't work or you, fi you find a bug or whatever, uh, is that a rollback as far as uh, like rolling back the commit or are you using feature toggles? It's a rollback to the latest deployed version. Okay. Only other case is, um, so sometimes we commit uh, the rollback, so it will be deployed as it. Sometimes we tell manually to the production, get back to this version. We don't want to have all the CI run again. We say, okay, that's really scary now, so roll back. But yeah, it can be either one commit that we push and it's going to be deployed. Either it's manual and say, okay, what was the last one? This one, because yeah. Sometimes you know it works with Git, you push 10 commits and you don't want just to revert 10 times. So does that answer the question? Well, while I have the microphone, is uh, so do you do a lot of feature branching or continuous integration? No, Only. we almost do not do feature branches. We try to avoid this as much as possible. We prefer to have loads of small commits on the master. That you, you are making my day. I, I think I'm going to, to cry at one moment. <laughs> The only moment we really do uh, feature branches, there are, let's say, two special cases. Infrastructure uh, migrations, typically we use Ember.js for the front end, and you can hardly commit uh, a change of version of Ember.js in one commit. You can, it's huge, but you won't. So in that case, we uh, do a branch, and the persons who are working on that either when they are uh, tearing their hairs off. Uh, but yeah, they, they try to get the master as often as possible, but it's a lot of work and it can take up to two weeks sometime or even more to migrate to a new version. So in that case, uh, that's, this is done on a feature, a feature branch. The other case, Technically, it's me who do that, so you can shout on me. Uh, when I'm working on, yeah, basically working on new prototypes, and I don't want to, uh, well, first bother my colleagues with uh, prototyping some stuff, and in that case, I tend to do that on a different branch. But everything that is planned, yeah, 95% of the time, it's done on the master and pushed as often as possible. Thank you. No, I'm scared now. <laughs> well, so you talked about um, using BDD lots, and are there any times when you push code to production that you haven't written scenarios for where maybe it's quite experimental or... But doesn't have scenarios, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or it doesn't have tests even. You haven't test driven it. You've just... We... But you want to push it out and find out, it's some, test, test something. It's really rare, it's not tested. That may happen sometime, so we are pretty fond of TDD. So, so you would te if you're sort of prototyping something. Yeah, prototype sometimes they don't have really Conceptually, the test. You, would te you wouldn't test it in production, you'd use other means to do that. Yeah, yeah. but it's really more for, for things that yeah, we just want to give a try quickly and stuff like that, but normally, we got the feature, we got that automated. All the examples more than the features. 
So I think it's interesting because you, you, well, until Hip Test was acquired by SmartBear, you were a, an owner of the company, right? You were a yeah. co-founder of the company. So you were an entrepreneur and a developer, and you were doing this practice of BDD, TDD. Would you, would you, like, if you started another company, would you do the same again? Would you, you know, do, do you, be, what do you, what would you say to a, an entrepreneur who said, oh, I couldn't have my developers doing TDD because they'd be going too slowly? What would you say? No, I would go with BDD right on. The difference is I wouldn't hire this Vincent developer who thinks everything should be written with Gherkin. But that's the only <laughs> thing. No, really, uh, I really enjoy that. There's things I would do differently. I would spend more time discussing and avoiding this kind of failure. But once again, we learned it. We know it sucks. And now we do it correctly. Or we hope we do it the most correctly we can. But definitely, no. Uh, there's been, as a developer, yeah, at least two really huge game changer. Uh, first one was TDD. Like, oh, and you know it doesn't break when you commit stuff. Yeah, <gasps> that's awesome. So that was the one of the first. The second one was the CI. Like, oh, you stop forgetting to commit one of the files. You push that, and it breaks. So that was two of the one and. I think BDD, yeah, could be the third one. At least I wouldn't, for sure I wouldn't abandon TDD, and I wouldn't like to abandon BDD. Both are something I really, really, really like. Yeah, let's have beers. No, <laughs> but you can see me tomorrow. <laughs> so, so BDD, the, the, the concept, um, it, uh, it seems to work really well with like smaller companies, like like more SaaS-based tools. What what would your advice be for um, tools that are thick client, large applications that have three to four month release cycles, where uh, a lot of the um, the code that we write are not features but more yeah. architecture and things like that? Does BDD like work in in that scenario? I would hire this guy to do some training first. <laughs> It would be easier. Now, uh, one thing we often say with our users who are facing this kind of thing, but basically what uh, Matt said, don't try to do everything with BDD. I've seen uh, users like, Ooh, I've got this huge project we are working on for 10 years now, and this user was going to do what this Vincent developer uh, did two years ago, like, Ooh, I'm going to make the smoke test, the regression test as BDD. No, don't. That are working fine. Let them the way they are. You can automate them, of course. But the guys from uh, the product team, they may not find them really helpful to understand what the product does. So what I would do is yeah, start on one user story and from a new one, basically what you said, because that's the best way. Getting confident on new things. I'm pretty sure you have new features coming in, like I don't know integrating test complete with hip test, that would be a great idea to do, Maybe. I think. But just my idea. Uh, but yeah, those new features, some um, user story of those new features and try BDD on them. But basically all that already exists, all that is already uh, tested and automated, don't try to convert the existing to BDD. That can be done maybe later on, and I'm not even sure, but after a lot of practice. Am I correct? Well, remember the first B. What's the B? The first B. Behavior. Right. So you, you use it when you're changing behavior, not when you're changing architecture. Hey. Hey. That's hard. Um, so we, uh, using BDD, you want to test behavior. And your application is Ember and Rails. How do you accomplish that technically when part of the behavior is on the front end, part of it is on the Rails side? Do you use multiple worlds, just test part of the behavior from the front end um, in one go and then test the remaining? How, how does that work with you guys? So, so uh, what we do, but once again, after what Matt said, I may start wondering. What we do is uh, all the scenarios that are written 
so part of the BDD process, so the Gherkin ones, are all end-to-end -end tests. So we don't do uh, some tests only for the front end, some tests only for the back end, and some uh, for the total one. Those 500 scenarios so coming from uh, the feature we discussed with the product, all of them are uh, really at the UI level and really top level one. But once again, it's 500 test cases or scenarios on almost 12,000 uh, scenarios. We do lots and lots of testing, but either on the, I can't, I can't see, can't remember if the numbers are there. Come on. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so really for the, the front end parts, uh, 200,000 of them, and as you can see, loads on the aspect part. And that's how we do. And the funny thing, what I said is um, we keep BDD and especially Gherkin really to describe what is the behavior of the feature and so on. But in those Ember tests, so they are written with uh, JavaScript Q unit. We have one of our colleagues who had lots of given when then as comments in the test cases to help understand what the, the test does. But yeah, that's basically how it works. And one thing to note on the 800 uh, aspect one, it includes so from unit level, but also some other end-to-end -end tests that are not run by BDD. Does it answer your question? Great. Yep. I would get there, but I, ju I just think it's interesting to observe because I've seen exactly the same sort of ratio as well that the pyramids are really dodgy metaphor in terms of its shape because it's the ratio you've got just your unit test for your back end, 16 times as many unit tests as you have no. acceptance tests. These are, we should rework this slide. Uh, those ones are not only unit tests, the 8,000. There is, uh, okay. co of course, a load of unit tests. Oh, because it's rail, in, so the yeah, controller Everything test is in aspect. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's and same thing. The Ember test can go really uh, unit level integration or really acceptance test that are also written in uh, Ember. Yeah. So it doesn't really match this. I still, I still think this. though. No, I'm not saying it's 500 top two. Yeah. I still think you've you've almost certainly got a lot more unit tests yeah. than you have. Like the pyramid is is not this shape. It's like. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's more like this, yeah. and yeah, yeah, we've got a pretty cool uh, coverage even just at the unit level, but doing our best for that. All is good. Any other Thank you. Uh.